The financial bubble that gripped Taiwan in the 1980s is one of the wildest the world has ever seen. Stock prices went up more than 12x in less than four years. Over a third of the Taiwanese population over the age of 15 were actively playing in the stock market. And on peak days in February 1990, trading on the Taipei Stock Exchange exceeded the turnover of both Tokyo and the New York Stock Exchanges combined. This is the story behind the boom and bust of Taiwan's seldom discussed yet spectacular stock market bubble. After losing the Chinese Civil War in 1949, the head of the nationalist government Chiang Kai-shek plus 2 million of his followers evacuated to the island of Taiwan. Taiwan then became the base of the new Republic of China, with a government run by Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang Party. The early years were tumultuous. Millions of refugees, scarce job opportunities and inflation wiped out the savings of many individuals. A key reform that the new government undertook was the redistribution of land. Between 1951 and 1953, they redistributed over 400,000 acres of land from large private land holdings to individuals. The landlords received payment for their land through 10-year government bonds and shares of government-owned companies, although inflation would add up most of the value of these bonds, so the land reform essentially transferred resources from the landowning class to individuals with the added benefit of farm productivity rising in the process. The economic policy also shifted to the promotion of manufacturing exports. Thus, Taiwan experienced an export boom that continued from the 1950s all the way to the 90s. One consequence of booming exports and a fixed exchange rate was an accumulation of foreign exchange reserves. By the mid-80s, Taiwan's foreign exchange reserves were only slightly smaller than Japan's, a country with five times the population of Taiwan. And it wasn't just the Taiwanese getting in on the action. Before 1983, there really wasn't any effective, legal way for an international investor to buy Taiwanese stocks. But in the mid-80s, the stock market was finally opened to foreign investors and money started pouring in. With booming exports, Taiwan's current account surplus reached 19% of gross national income by the mid-80s. As hot money flowed into the country, by 1985, the CBC finally allowed the Taiwanese dollar to appreciate. And these capital inflows caused interest rates to plummet, meaning households sought higher returns in other financial instruments since bank deposits yielded almost nothing. So this part is important for the context around the behavioural side of things. In 1985, an illegal lottery named Daji Alert was created. Its popularity exploded. The jackpot offered was far more than any of the state-sponsored lotteries, and it felt like suddenly just about everyone was into illegal gambling. One reason why Darjee Alert also flourished was because of the economic slump in the summer of 85. The unemployment rate increased to a decade high of 4.1% and 320,000 unemployed Taiwanese were in search of jobs. Many of them became disillusioned and turned to gambling. But after a few years, the government cracked down on these illegal lotteries. The state-sponsored Patriotic Lottery ended abruptly in 1987 and the illegal lotteries such as Darjee Alert were also shut down, therefore after, due to government pressure. Stephen Champion, author of The Great Taiwan Bubble, described how hundreds of thousands of these gamblers were now in search of a new fix, and that many of them must have turned to the stock market for the speculation as an outlet. Plus, remember how earlier I mentioned how people were unhappy with bank savings rates? Can you guess what happens next? Optimism was in the air. In 1987, Taiwan officially became a democracy, martial law was lifted, and new political parties were formed and media censorship eased. On the financial side, the central bank issued new brokerage license and eased listing requirements. There was a huge increase in the number of licensed brokerages, from 27 in June 1988 to 297 in March of 1990. Easily available, but generally illegal, margin credit was provided through many of these brokers. In 1985, there was only around 400,000 investors in Taiwan, but by the 1990s first quarter, active brokerage accounts reached 4.6 million in a country with a population of just 20 million. And brokers looking for new market niches eventually established offices specifically targeting housewives, doctors, farmers and students to lure more customers in. Foreign media jokingly started calling Taiwan the Republic of Casino. The anecdotes of the time are incredible. Primary school teachers quizzed their students to see what stocks their parents were buying. It was assumed that in the TIEX, a long-term investment is three hours. And stories of high school girls desperate to accumulate savings to throw into the market even turned to part-time prostitution. In 1988, TIEX broke through the 7,000 mark, up over 10x since 1985.
property prices across Taiwan tripled in two years. In Taipei alone, they increased four and a half times in four years. The market faltered briefly in 1988, but quickly regained momentum. During that year, President Li Tung-hui appointed Shirley Kuo as Minister of Finance. To control the stock market bubble, Kuo announced a tax on gains derived from securities transactions. Investors took the news incredibly well, as you can predict, and the TIEX plummeted for 19 straight days, going from above 7,000 to below 5,000. Investors were unhappy to put it mildly. Fearful of losing next year's elections, however, the government backed down and cancelled the tax. As the market surged, stockbrokers held wild celebrations on their trading floors. Brokers offered free champagne, exploding firecrackers, buffet lunches and musical performances to their most loyal customers. Totally normal behaviour in a bull market. Among retail investors, attention soon turned towards the almost mystical 10,000 level. Some scoffed at the idea that the market ever rise that high. But in June, the index smashed through 10,000 and crowds celebrated wildly on the trading floors. And only a few months later, the index hit 12,000. Stephen Champion, who was managing funds focused on Taiwanese stocks at the time, remembers thinking to himself, once you're beyond the limits of logic, there's no telling where the market will go. I guess that 12,000 isn't really any crazier than 8,000 or 20,000. A common excuse for the frenzy was that foreigners just don't understand the Taiwanese market. A taxi driver recounted that the market worked like magic. He had been able to make 5 million US dollars in the market, and when asked about the potential risks of the market, I know that some people think the market might fall out of bed, but they just don't understand Taiwan. The return over the previous five years was honestly hard to believe. The Thai X had gone from 1,000 points in 1986 to 12,000 in 1990. 12X return in less than four years. By the fall of 1989, the average price to earnings ratio on the Thai X was 100 times, roughly double the already high PE multiple of 51 in Japan at the time. Also in 1989, on average, every share had changed hands just under six times. And on peak days, as we mentioned, trading on the Taipei Stock Exchange exceeded the combined turnover of both the Tokyo and New York Stock Exchanges. When the Taiwan Stock Exchange Index closed at 12,495 on February 10, 1990, no one rang a bell to announce that the last breath of air had been blown into the bubble. But Taiwanese investor psychology would soon shift. In early 1990, the market started faltering again, but it had done this previously before scaling to new, uncharted heights. But instead, the market entered a vicious bear market. Many retail investors thought the government provided an almost guaranteed protection on the downside. The Kuomintang party had used the booming stock market for their recent election campaign slogan, Big Profits and Great Prosperity. Many interpreted this as an implied guarantee against market losses. Trading volume even reached new highs just after the market started tanking, with traders doubling down on every single dip. But then slowly, but surely, denial turned to anger, anger to depression, then depression to a gradual acceptance of the new reality. Taiwan's stock market bubble had finally popped. Maybe the Taiwanese weren't so different after all. After the stock market began its inevitable descent, investors and opposition parties blamed the government for the disastrous result. In a series of protests in 1990, investors begged the government to step in and save the market. A couple of other crazy tales from the tumble include a senior SEC official suffering multiple stab wounds at the hand of an unknown assassin, the corporate headquarters of a listed company was firebombed, and the president of one brokerage house hung himself by a curtain cord in his bedroom as a response to the insurmountable business problems. Stephen Champion recounts how his driver had inherited farmland wealth that he later recirculated into the stock market and had made so much money that he quit his driver job to focus on day trading. In 1990, as the market had started to turn, he doubled down with underground margin loans and was eventually wiped out when he couldn't meet the margin calls. Feeling sorry for his old driver, Stephen rehired him at full salary, at least enabling to make a new life for himself. But interestingly enough, the stock market crash did not have large ramifications for the wider economy because during the bubble's peak, the banking system remained highly capitalised, with debt-to-equity ratios around 100% and mortgage lending requiring large down payments, meaning that people didn't lose their homes and their shirts after the market went arse up. So overall, after the speculative mania, the country more or less returned to normal. Some parts of Taiwan's current stock market bring back memories of the bubble years. From the lows of 2020 through to Jan 2022, the TIEX has almost doubled 
And the unemployment caused by the virus has in some way resembles Taiwan's recession of 1985. Back then, nearly unemployed, with too much time on their hands, they speculated on the national lottery. Today, they've changed the national lottery for tech stocks and crypto. But if we're being honest, the mania that gripped Taiwanese society over 30 years ago will be hard to match ever again. Today's PE multiple is only at 15 times, compared to the 100 times at the height of the bubble. Taiwan in the 80s was truly a special time. A time that will probably go in the history books as one of the greatest stock market bubbles the world has ever seen. Enjoyed this video? Make sure to check out the source material at Asian Century Stocks. I'm a happy paying subscriber and I cannot recommend Michael's work enough. I'm beyond appreciative if you've watched this far and don't forget to subscribe to the channel to receive more. If you've enjoyed this kind of history deep dive, you might also like my story on Robert Kwok and how he became the sugar king. But until next time, have a good one.